Uh, David Icke, we talked just before the break about uh, George Bush and William Jefferson Clinton, a yeah. Republican and a Democrat, but really it's the same animal. And, and I think the pedigree was very important, and I'd like you just to briefly sketch that out again. Well, the, the, the whole point of the, uh, the bringing Clinton in was uh, my understanding of it um, is that um, Bush and Clinton uh, were talking to each other even before um, Bush became uh, president. He was vice president at the time. And they were working on this old idea, because they're members of the same force. Um, they're Illuminati frontmen. And um, we have to be kept into this, uh, this myth that um, uh, we have a choice. Otherwise, we realize we are actually live in a dictatorship in a one-party state. Now, it's known, and this is the same in Britain, too, that when a, a, a party has been in power for a certain number of terms... Um, because nothing ever changes, because it's the same force in power, whoever's in, mm -hmm. um, they know that the, the mass psyche will eventually reach a point where it says, oh, well, they've done no good, time for a change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they had to um, organize their, um, their guy into the position of representing the opposition mm -hmm. at the time, which was the Democrats. Mm -hmm. So he would be there when this psyche, uh, mass psyche uh, change happened, and they said, well, let's have a change. Hmm. And if you think about it, what was the mantra message that um, uh, Bill Clinton came out with again and again and again throughout the 1992 campaign? It was time for a change. Sure. I stand for change. Change, yeah, change, yeah. change. Because that's what he was appealing to. And incidentally, this is another interesting point, given what we're talking about. Um, in 1991, um, and a relatively unknown governor for Arkansas at the time, Bill Clinton, was invited by David Rockefeller to the Bilderberg meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany. You know, I remember and, that. Well, I, I noted that at the time. I remember that. I saw one of the very rare news reports in an alternative newspaper about that, and yeah. I was very, very well aware of what that meant at the time. Yeah, a year later, the guy's president of the United States. Yep. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, uh, I talked about the pyramid, and um, it's relevant to, the, to what we're looking at now, and how... Uh, there is this unwritten kind of myth perpetuated between the politicians and the media that the presidents and prime ministers of the, wo of the world are the peak of the pyramid of decision-making in politics. M most of the time, they're nowhere near the top. I mean, Bush is higher than most. I mean, he's higher than Clinton in the pyramid uh, because he was born into... Bush was born into this uh, conspiracy because uh, his father, um, Prescott Bush, was one of the people who, through the Harriman organization, helped to fund Hitler. It's no accident that it's, it's uh, Prescott Bush's son, George Bush, who went on to be head of the CIA and... Um, um, head of the Republican Party at the time of Watergate and, uh, and eventually Vice President President of the United States. But if you look at um, the major positions of power in the world, whether it's President of the United States or whatever, uh, it's amazing the common themes between them. For instance, um, the last five Secretary Generals of NATO, and I only know it's the last five because that's as far as I've had time to research <laughs> back so far, but it's many yeah. more than that. Right. Joseph Lunds, Lord Carrington... Um, Manfred Werner, Willy Clace, and the present one, Javier Solana. Mm -hmm. They're all Bilderbergers. Uh, it's a Bilderberg appointment, the Secretary General of NATO. Same with the head of the World Bank, James Wolfenson, the current one, that was, who was um, put into that position by Bill Clinton. He's a Bilderberger, Trilateral Commission member. Uh, one of his predecessors, uh, Robert uh, McNamara, with the inspired middle name of Strange, an American, <laughs> uh, head of the World Bank, he was a Bilderberger. And, yes, and, and indeed. He, these appointments are, are decided. Uh, it's like the major appointments in um, in America, in the American administration. If you look at the Carter administration, um, he was the first trilateral commission president of the United States. Mm -hmm. his, his, his administration was awash with members of, that, uh, of the same organization and the Council on Foreign Relations. Walter Mondale, his vice president, trilateral commission. Cyrus Vance, uh, secretary of state, trilateral commission. A guy called Brzezinski, who was his... Um, a national security advisor, he was the one who, with David Rockefeller, set up the trilateral Yes, commission. yes, and you've got Harold Brown, General David Jones, Stansfield Turner, uh, on and on. All of them, yeah, and, and, and when the Bush-Reagan uh, administration came in and replaced the Democratic one of Carter, um, th their administrations were awash with members of the Council on Foreign Relations.
which is the Trilateral Commission, and the same when the um, Clinton administration came in. I mean, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a one-party state, and it, actually it's a one-party world increasingly. That's the point we need to get, because, you know, you look at Harold Wilson and... Um, uh, Ted Heath, two people who opposed each other in Britain and swapped the premiership of Britain between yes. about 63, 64 and 1975, right. they were both Bilderbergers. Um, and, and Margaret Thatcher was a Bilderberger. And, and so it goes on. Uh, the present leader of the Labour Party, who looks certain to become the next Prime Minister of Britain, he's a Bilderberger. And interestingly, taking the Clinton story uh, to, to Britain, in 1993... Uh, this virtually unknown um, Labour Party um, home affairs spokesman, Tony Blair, was invited to the Bilderberg meeting in uh, Greece. Mm -hmm. And uh, a year later, after the very, very sudden death of the Labour leader, John Smith, in came Tony Blair, who um, uh, within 24 hours of John Smith's uh, sudden death uh, <laughs> was elected leader of the Labour Party by the whole of the British media. Wow. Amazing. So it's, uh, you know, if, if you want to get on in politics, uh, Jeff, then, then get David Rockefeller to invite you to the Bilderberg meeting, yeah. and it's uh, off you go. Really. Well, my, my father said something once, and I, I think we talked earlier about this. He said anyone who seeks public office should be barred from it. That's a, that, that's a, that is actually a, a very, very profound statement, because um, there's another statement I hear which says um, anyone who gets to the top in politics uh, is the wrong person to be there. Yeah. Uh, it's because the yeah. structure of politics and what it demands exactly. of people and their it, attitudes uh, that it demands of them to get to the top of the greasy pole. What, a, what an amazing uh, game is afoot. Just amazing. And uh, so many people just don't have a clue. I don't pretend to know it all, but I have peeked again behind the curtain, which you are endeavoring to help all of us do tonight, mm. to let us know there is much more going on than we'll ever read in the mass media or hear or see on television, which, by the way, as you of course know, may be the most insidious powerful weapon ever unleashed on humankind. The average American child now, uh, David Icke, watches television up from 38 hours a week to 43 hours a week. Yeah, and, and um, if you look at who owns the major networks in, uh, in America, it's the same people. It is the same people. It's the same people who own the networks, who own the banks, who own the politicians, who own the security agencies, who own the, the, um, uh, the multinational corporations. Uh, it is the same people, and, uh, and the truth shall set you free in great detail that shows how all these lines of power come back to the same people in the same uh, operation. And the money system, this ludicrous uh, thing we stand for of uh, borrowing money that doesn't exist and paying interest on it, is, is the key uh, foundation way that they control the mass. Let's go ahead, and I was going to hold that, but let's, let's start that right now. You just said it all borrowing money that doesn't exist and paying interest on it. That gets back to fractional banking, I guess, to a degree. The idea of printing money of which there is no backing, yeah. loaning it and collecting interest on it, is, is the greatest scam I have ever in my life seen. It's astonishing, and, and, and mo most of the money isn't actually printed. Um, uh, the, um, it goes back, because this is, again, you know, as we keep talking about, this is a long-term thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Prince Bernhard, who was... Um, the first head of the Bilderberg Group and a major manipulator. He was actually a German prince who married into the uh, Dutch royal family. Mm -hmm. uh, a predecessor of his, another German uh, member of royal, German royalty who married into the Dutch royal family, was a guy called uh, uh, Orange. Um, and uh, he um, uh, became uh, king of England eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he... Uh, was the one when he was uh, on the throne of England who set up uh, the Bank of England, which came out of the um, uh, the whole. Out of that came spawned the whole of this central banking network, which again is a massive pyramid. And at the top of the central banking system of the world are about 13 people who uh, operate um, out of Switzerland. Uh, it's no uh, surprise or coincidence that whenever there's a war in Europe, the one country never involved in <laughs> Switzerland, because that's, that's the financial base of that's the people right. that are causing the wars. Amazing. Um, and so this is um, kind of um, from William of Orange and, uh, and his time uh, creating this, the... Uh, Bank of England and all that went, has come off from it has spawned this a whole idea of um, lending money that doesn't exist and charging interest on it. And uh, it works like this, you know, that what the banks say 
is all they're doing is borrowing uh, money from investors, effectively, from depositors, and lending it to people that want loans. That is actually a complete lie. They are not doing that. If you take a simple example, um, take a, um, a bank and say it's got one investor, for, for simple terms. It's got one investor. Someone has deposited with that bank a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Along comes another guy who wants to borrow a loan of a hundred grand. And uh, to do that, he has to put up as collateral wealth that does exist, like his house or his business or whatever. Sure. So the bank says, okay, yeah, okay, we'll lend you the hundred thousand pounds. And they, all they do, they don't print the money. They just type into that man's account a hundred thousand dollars. Now, if all they're doing is lending investors money, um, then the guy who deposited a million dollars has now got in his account 900000 But, of course, he hasn't. His statement still says he's got a million dollars in that bank. But now this guy's statement says he's got $100,000 in his account. Now, where has the $100,000 come from? It's come from nowhere. It's just someone typing figures onto a screen, not even printing the money. And from that point on, he is paying interest on a hundred thousand dollars, and all the bank has done is type figures onto a, onto a screen. The overwhelmingly vast majority of so-called money, most of which doesn't even exist, even as physical money, mm-hmm. it, it, not even back, unbacked physical money, it's just <laughs> figures on a screen. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes into existence as a debt to start with. The stuff we use to theoretically purchase with is actually a debt to start with because only about 10% of money actually comes out of the, 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 the government itself. Most yes. of the so-called right. money in circulation is brought into circulation by the private banks loaning figures on a screen and charging interest on them. I saw an amazing figure uh, from Australia for 1991, which is very significant uh, for the world because it's the same around the world. In 1991, of 203 billion Australian dollars theoretically in circulation, only 12 billion existed as coins and bits of paper. All the other stuff was figures on a screen. And and this is um, fundamental to our freedom and our way of life because it's like... uh, getting wet paint on your fingers, um, this uh, interest Only one, one minute, David. It, one minute, David. Everywhere. Mm-hmm. For instance, every single um, product that we pick mm-hmm. off the shelf, every mm-hmm. one, the price of that is considerably inflated in compared with what it needs to be. Oh, sure. Because everyone in the production process the transportation process and the shop that sells it and everything, they're all adding a little bit extra to their price. We've got to take our break now coming up. uh, Okay, because uh, because they need to pay interest on money that doesn't exist. I I just don't understand how uh, the average person can can so readily take on such vast debt, but when you think about the from cradle to grave indoctrination we are given, from credit cards right on down the line to the old installment payment plan, I guess it's, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, and, and I, I did a, a workshop in England. Uh, that what staggered me is, is how many people in the banking system and in politics have no idea how the banking system works. Is that right? Um, I was talking yeah. to this guy. He came to a workshop I did, it, uh, I don't know, about six months ago, and he'd just retired from the banking uh, world. He'd been in it all his life, um, and uh, in the last year, they'd uh, eased him out by giving him a research project to do. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me in almost disbelief, and he said, it doesn't exist, does it? It's just figures on a screen. And I thought, and you've been in the banking system all your life and you've just realized that. And so why should the public uh, realize how it works when even some people in the banking system haven't got a clue? Amazing. Uh, I guess a a, a word of advice to the average consumer, uh, if you want to be free, at least uh, (laughs) entertain a semblance of freedom, keep the debt load minimized and get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you look, uh, maybe we could look um, a little later at uh, how the American debt came into um, into existence, the, yes, the will, biggest uh... debt in the world. See, one of the great ways, uh, the great way that we are manipulated in the world m- on a mass scale is something I call problem-reaction-solution. You create the problem covertly. It may be a government collapse. It might be a run on a currency. It might be a terrorist bomb. And we've had a few of them recently, none of which have had responsibility claim for, interestingly. Yes. Uh, and then you offer your solution. Uh, say, for a terrorist bomb, 
if you want more um, uh, power to the security forces, uh, people are not just going to accept more power if you just suggest it. So you have to manipulate them to demand it. Centralizing control and justifying power is um, a, a global threat to the environment. Now, two years after 1966 uh, came the Club of Rome, which was set up on the Rockefeller's estate in Italy and um, involved um, uh, uh, people in, linked into this Bilderberg Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations Network. It, it's another uh, arm of that. And underneath the global threat to the uh, uh, global environment uh, was um, a threat from an extraterrestrial force. That was in, 19, in the 1960s. Sure. It said, that is one way of justifying centralization of power mm -hmm. and controlling the population. And it's kind of interesting that um, I, I was involved in Britain in the environmental movement right through the 80s. Um, and um, it's interesting how all the major global reports saying there's a global environmental problem, something must be done, are actually put together and paid for and, and uh, funded and um, orchestrated by the people who are actually dismantling this planet's ecology. There's a guy in America, a Canadian, called Morris Strong, who's very much linked into this whole network I've been talking about tonight, mm -hmm. very close to the Rockefellers and David Rockefeller. He was the first head of the uh, UN Environment Agency, and he was the head of the 1992 Earth Summit in Brazil, of which uh, there was global publicity. Um, there's a problem with the environment, something must be done. Oh, that's right. So, so yeah. when the people suggesting the solutions are also creating the problems, my, my ears prick up very you rapidly. Bet. You're real fast. This, of course, this whole ET threat thing goes back to General Douglas MacArthur, who made the famous speech at West Point. Uh, the great anchorman, Ronald Reagan, made four different references exactly. to an off-planet threat. Uh, and with movies like Independence Day and others, and now coming up in December, a very big film called Mars Attacks. Again, a hostile, not a Steven Spielberg, benign, benevolent E.T., but a hostile E.T. film. Uh, one wonders. And, and I, I really do believe that the, the vast majority of people have been lulled into such a sense of... Uh, they're, in, they're anesthetized, if I have used that word before. I think it's more appropriate now than ever. Uh, and they would be easy prey for a setup like that. 